Joining me now, NBC Chief White House Correspondent and Weekend Today co-host Peter Alexander and Wall Street Journal White House reporter Sabrina Siddiqui. So, Peter, first to you, the big news from the President of the United Nations today. Uh, a number of issues, including artificial intelligence, yeah. global warming, very important, an appeal to the global south, uh, an alignment against Russia, importantly. There's also a lot on, you know, well, the Middle East. Yeah, no doubt. Well, the president had, there are a lot of global challenges right now. Obviously, Ukraine remains at the top of that list. Notably, the president only used parts of his remarks to focus on Ukraine. President Volodymyr Zelensky, Andrew, as you know well, will be making his first in-person appearance here at the United Nations General Assembly since the war began. Clearly, the White House believes he is the best advocate for Ukraine at this time. But the president didn't mince words when he described that naked aggression right now of Russia, saying it's critical that the world community uh, fights back against that naked aggression today to deter would-be aggressors tomorrow. That language obviously uh, focuses on a variety of countries, most notably China right now, and the fear that China could invade Ukraine going forward. He praised the brave people of Ukraine. But the president recognizes the need for a collective effort, not just on the issue of Ukraine, but on so many other issues, including food insecurity, with food prices around the world spiking right now, in part due to what's taking place in Ukraine. Also talking about the need to focus on issues of the future, like uh, artificial intelligence. Take a listen. Emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence hold both enormous potential and enormous peril. We need to be sure they are used as tools of opportunity, not as weapons of, of oppression. The United States is working to strengthen rules and policies so AI technologies are safe before they're released to the public. To make sure we govern this technology, not the other way around, having it govern us. It's going to take all of us to get this right. The president describing this as an inflection point in world history. Of course, the concern, I, as I noted earlier, was not that China would invade Ukraine. China would invade Taiwan. But those are some of the real issues that this president uh, is facing, that the global community faces right now. As it relates to Ukraine, Andrei, most specifically, Volodymyr Zelensky, he will speak uh, later today. And then he goes down to Washington, D.C., which is significant. He's going to meet with President Biden one-on-one -on -one at the White House. He'll meet with lawmakers as well, really make the case on his his own behalf for additional funding to help support his war, just as Vladimir Putin has been meeting with Kim Jong-un, obviously in the eastern part of Russia right now. But it comes at a time when, uh, when Republicans are skeptical of sending more money to Ukraine. And Americans, broadly, Andrea, a majority of them oppose additional funding to Ukraine. And funding is at the heart, you know, right in the, middle, in the middle of everything that's going on in Congress right now. Sabrina, I also want to play what the president had to say about China, just as Peter was referencing uh, a big line drawn about China doing anything to tip the balance on Ukraine. I want to be clear and consistent. We seek to responsibly manage the competition between our countries so it does not tip into conflict. I've said we are for de-risking, not decoupling with China. We also stand ready to work together with China on issues where progress hinges on our common efforts. Nowhere is that more critical than accelerating the climate crisis. And this, Sabrina, after Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, as NBC broke this story over the weekend, went secretly to Malta to meet with Wang Yi, the uh, top foreign policy advisor to President Xi, to try to restore relationships, because they still have not announced a meeting. They haven't said specifically that President Xi is going to come to the United States in San Francisco for the APEC summit in November, or have a meeting even before that with President Biden. Uh, you're absolutely right, Andrea. And President Biden's comments on China, I think, were in many ways a reflection of the careful line that his administration has been walking when it comes to Beijing. You know, you heard President Biden say that the U.S. is not seeking conflict with China. This follows months of efforts by his administration to maintain an open line of communication with Beijing and try and diffuse tensions. But he also made clear that the U.S. will push back on aggression and intimidation. And so we 
we've also seen these other efforts by the Biden administration to counter Beijing's influence in the Indo-Pacific by strengthening ties with India. That was a big focus at the G20 summit in Delhi just over a week ago. And revamping how the World Bank works with low and middle income countries. That was something else that the president referenced in his speech. But to your point, Andrea, we still don't know when President Biden himself is going to sit down with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. They have not met now in nearly a year. And there is this lingering question about whether or not they will, in fact, uh, meet at APEC in uh, San Francisco uh, later this year. And what, of course, would come from that meeting after months and months of this uh, careful uh, balancing act that the administration uh, has been putting forward, especially after you know tensions had really escalated to new heights uh, following the Chinese spy balloon incident earlier this year. And Peter, let me just also bring you back to ground level on this funding crisis. Um, we're going to talk about more of this later in the program, but yeah. Senator Tuberville holding up all of the military confirmations uh, on Ukraine. Just today, Lloyd Austin in Germany at a defense minister's meeting on Ukraine said right. that Ukraine has now gotten regained 54 percent of the territory that Russia had taken. That's not as good a record of the spring offensive as they had wanted. And the Ukraine money, as you had pointed out, is in trouble. The, this whole fight over the spending bill, uh, even if they get this stopgap that the House is doing, it's a non-starter in the Senate because it's below the levels of what they agreed to during the debt ceiling crisis. And let me just say one other thing. PEPFAR. The president mentioned this. Thank goodness he mentioned it. 20-year anniversary. 20-year anniversary. President Bush heralded it in an op-ed in the Washington Post. It was the, I've just been to Africa, you've been there. It is the best thing, the best advertisement for U.S. aid. So PEPFAR, for those and, who don't know, obviously, is AIDS relief in Africa that saved other, 25 million lives, of course. 25 million lives. They haven't reauthorized it. It's a bipartisan bill. It was Republican. Bono has been standing yeah. next to George W. Bush on this. And it is, let me just say something. It is unbelievable. I've just been in Chad. You know, you've had Niger go, Gabon, these co coups, anti-Americanism and anti-colonialism against the French and others growing. And the Chinese and the Russians, not just the Wagner group, but they are everywhere with the populations. And we've done more for Africa and health with PEPFAR than any other administration, particularly a Republican administration. And it's stalled. Well, notably, as you make that point, there are real concerns throughout the rest of the world right now. The global south, as it's described, parts of Africa, Asia, Latin America, that so much emphasis on Ukraine does risk the focus that those countries want. Developing nations in so many parts of the world need for issues like efforts to combat viruses, AIDS, whatever else you name it. And so that's a real that's a real concern. Only thing I will add here is this president has a unique opportunity on this U.N. that's unlike others in the past, which is the leaders of Russia, China, France and the U.K. are all absent this year, which, in the words of the advisors, allows President Biden, if he handles the moment appropriately, to be the president of the world, to really make this case on behalf of the world. And I think that was the effort that today sort of communicated.